Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to The Angel. We're a podcast devoted to, of course, angel investors and VCs, family offices, and basically anyone who is looking to invest money into startups. Um, we are a companion podcast to The Accelerator, and uh, you can find us on all the major podcast platforms, including Amazon, Apple, Audible, uh, and so on, and also on YouTube. For video and you can get both video and audio on Spotify so please rate us and like us and tell your friends share the podcast if you can we appreciate all of that and today we have um, a very special guest and I'm saying that for my own purposes Stephen Weinstein is the CEO of seismic capital um, Steve and I are Stephen and I are not going to bore you with all the reasons why we've had the same uh, uh, the well not the same career but I've never met anyone who kind of overlapped <laughs> in quite the same, same way. We started as journalists. We both did work uh, at or for uh, Reuters. Uh, we both became entrepreneurs. Um, but I want to start with seismic capital, and then, then we'll circle back. Because you have a very interesting model, I think. You're, you're kind of a VC, a venture capital firm with a difference. So what's the difference, Stephen? Well, Michael, thank you for having me today. It's yeah, a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, so Seismic was solving for two real problems. One was that um, not all investors were allowed to invest in venture capital, and we wanted to change that. Typically, you had to have a minimum investment of 10000 or 100000 or even a million dollars to invest in any kind of venture capital deal. And we, we've broken that mold. We can now take investors as little as a million, a thousand dollars. We're happy to take a million, but a thousand is something that nobody's ever been able to do. We designed Seismic from the ground up to be able to do that. On the investment side, we uh, believe that entrepreneurs who are venture backed can spend way too much time raising capital. So when we back a company, we back it all the way through its life cycle from the time it has a product and a customer until the time it goes public or gets sold, we're the capital source, and we think that makes it possible for our companies to concentrate on what makes them unique. Now, that's not all you do, I know, because, um, because uh, when, we, when we previously chatted about it, you talked about um, the things that entrepreneurs are good at and the things maybe they're not so good at, the things they should be spending their time on and those they shouldn't. So how do you make that split? How do you explain that dichotomy? Yeah, we, um, we think that what makes our companies unique is the things that they do that nobody else does. What we know from studies that we've done is that venture companies, early stage companies, new companies get caught up in a couple of things. One is they run out of money. When we're backing them, they're not gonna run out of money. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is that they get caught up in the world of the things that you have to do, but you really don't want to. And those mm -hmm. are things like legal, accounting, HR, benefits, all of that stuff that really can cause an entrepreneur to lose focus over mm -hmm. what becomes unique. Well. We know how to do all of those things. So when a company comes into Seismic, we, um, we take over all that back office admin. And it's really one of the things that the entrepreneurs that we're talking about making investment in have found to be most appealing, aside mm -hmm. from the patient capital that will last them their life cycle. So, so there's so much to talk about in, in just those two answers, um, Stephen. But, but one, one question I have just as somebody who, who used to start companies um, uh, and then try to keep afloat while I did, um, I'm assuming that you pay the entrepreneurs, the founders, uh, and their team, you're paying them as salaries, right? You're, you're, you're keeping them afloat financially, essentially, right? Oh, absolutely. We, we yeah. think that... If an entrepreneur is concentrating on where the, how are they going to make their mortgage payment or their rent payment, or where are they going to sleep tonight, that's not something that accrues to either their benefit or ours. So everybody in Seismic, in any of our companies, any of our relations, um, gets paid a living wage. Everybody who's running the companies and are a part of the companies gets some back-end participation. 
just like they would if they were getting backed by a standard venture capital company. It it sound of it sounds like um, founders must feel like they've died and gone to heaven. Because <laughs> well, you're we taking want, we a lot. We don't want them to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a metaphor, um, but but you're you're taking so much of being an entrepreneur to me. Being a founder is is painful. Uh, and that's my painful experience, and I think I share that with a lot of people. So what happens? What's the dynamic? when you take the pain out of it the way you have what's that like for the founders what what how does that contribute to a better company well like i said people who are worried about their finances don't perform at their peak performance um we run kind of like a in-house venture shop would run if we were in a company people work for our company or work for our com the companies that we're involved with you know, get benefits, they get salary, they get treated to uh, retirement packages, 401ks, things like that. Um, our entre we know that our entrepreneurs, to get to the point where we can invest in them, have probably run up their credit cards, have probably been through all their families and their friends, and are probably kind of at the end of that rope. And we want to make it comfortable for them so they can do, like I said, what makes them unique and create value for us and for them. So typically, an entrepreneur coming into Seismic will get a signing bonus, help them clear the decks of some of that um, credit card debt that they may be carrying to get to this point, and then they get a paycheck like everybody else who works for a living gets. And, and we, we think that's really important, and that's why we set mm -hmm. things up that way. So would, 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 a, would a founder be, um, in effect, uh, or essentially a minority shareholder in the company rather than a majority shareholder in a more typical scenario? Well, it depends. It's, for us, it's just a case of math. You know, if a company is coming to us with, you know, call it $25 million worth of enterprise value and we're only putting in 10, well, then they get their post money, you know, 25, 30 fifths, and we get our post money 10, 30 fifths when we mm -hmm. sell the company. Okay, so it's, it's and, and is there, how much wiggle room is there as you sort of make that valuation of what the enterprise value is? Is that difficult? Well, we have some outside uh, third party folks that we use to set valuation. It's almost mm -hmm. always a range. We almost always will sit down with the company and say, here's what we found. Mm -hmm. Um, here's, you know, what do you think? And I can't really think of a circumstance where we've been very far off in terms of valuation, you know, because we're using the st you know, standard metrics for companies at the mm -hmm. stage that we invest in them. We use outside third parties. We're, you know, we're not cooking the books in order to get to a valuation that advantages mm -hmm. us or somebody else. And, and we'll share that information with the company. Here's what the competitive landscape looks like. Here's you know, how much we think you can grow. Here's much, how much you think you can grow. Um, here's what we think the exit looks like. Here's why that's important to us. How are we gonna make money? How are you gonna make money? How are we gonna impact the world? And when you have that kind of open conversation with a company, it, it does two things. It you know, helps set the stage for uh, what your investments is gonna look like and it also helps set the stage for trust and understanding between the parties because mm -hmm. we're working with these people and they're working with us. And we, wanna, we don't want to be working with people who are always wondering if we have their interests at heart in addition to ours. Sounds wonderfully logical and, and a, a great way to run an airline, so to speak. Um, but I, I want to circle back to Regulation D in a minute. But first, I want to ask you about the companies themselves. Do you have a specific thesis? Um, I know you have. You told me uh, that you have a fire hose of companies trying to get your attention. So you've got lots of choice uh, in choosing companies. So how many companies have you chosen? And what does this look like in three years and five years? What does your portfolio look like down the line? Well, we've deployed a um, diversified investment strategy. We'll look at almost everything. We like companies when they are just at a point where they are starting to prove who they are. They have a product, they have a customer, 
someone outside has said, yeah, I think this is a valid opportunity. Um, we'll invest later, but we don't have very many companies in the pipeline right now that look like that. They're almost all just at one, two, three, four customers, just starting to see what revenue looks and feels like. Um, we, uh, I'm sorry, Michael. I forgot the back half of your question. Well, well, I'm I'm, I'm just curious. Like you, so so you, as a thesis, you will look at you will look at everything, and um, you look you like companies very early. It sounds like like very early, um, not not on day one, but you know early. Yeah, we like it when it to, turns from an from an idea into something tangible. Into um, something tangible. Yeah, Define our, tangible for customers yeah. traction. What does that look like? looks like a customer and some something that <laughs> feels like traction. I mean, one of the yeah. companies that we're working with, um, you know, they have like three customers now. They happen to be Microsoft, AT&T, and Google. Those are you know, pretty good customers. And if it was yeah. only one, yeah. that would still be a pretty good customer. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, we have not made our first investment yet. We should have an announcement on that very, very soon. Uh, we have Four other companies that we either have signed a letter of intent with or we're about to sign a letter of intent with. So after, you know, it will be an overnight success after, you know, four years of arguing with the SEC and raising our initial capital. And tell me, um, tell me how, uh, if you can, any details on the kind of companies, the sectors, you know, the industries, sure. what do they look like? First one um, makes infrastructure software for the 5G cellular network. Um, it, uh, it functions primarily in the gaming space. The mm -hmm. second one is in the, um, is in the world of motivational messaging for business leaders, um, mm. which is kind of a, it's a business to business play right now. We think it can get converted into business co to consumer play. Mm -hmm. Um, the third one is in the world of, um, recycling carbon waste from uh, you know, aerospace manufacturing into things like putter heads and manhole covers. Uh, fantastic company. And you know, if you put carbon in the landfill, it never ever disintegrates because it's carbon. And so if we can take that scrap carbon fiber from making airplanes and, and uh, rocket ships, and turn it into something else. You know, we're doing something good for the world. Carbon putters are the hottest thing in golf right now. And uh, you know, we don't have to fill up the landfill. The, um, we have another one that's in the medi medical world, um, providing services to postpartum women, um, and so forth and so on. And how would you, if you could, characterize the common thread in the investors uh, pardon me, in the founders, the the people you're you're you know you're 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 buying into, you're getting behind, you're making a very long term commitment. Um, so you're kind of getting married in a sense. So what are, what are those founders, if anything, what do they have in common? What do you what do you what are you looking for? Every one of them has a driving need to change something in their industry. Every one of them has some experience in the industry that they're trading in. Um, every one of them has said, you know what, I'm willing to bet my own farm to make this thing work. And, you know, every one of them has demonstrated what they can do on a, you know, on a wing and a prayer and a bootstrap. And, you know, we're excited to be backing them with some capital and take away some of the headaches of running the business. Yeah, no, it, it sounds very interesting and very eclectic, obviously, you know, really, really different. So, so I wanted well, to spend I a think, moment. I th just one yeah. thing on that. I think when we have some investments in a particular sector, I think we will start to look for complementary companies to go with those initial investments. So mm -hmm. we'll see that mm -hmm. we'll start to get some, you know, areas of plurality, if not majority. Uh, and that'll make sense, you know, a bolt-on, a roll-up, something to add customers or capabilities. Um, we'll start mm -hmm. to seek those out once we have the initial portfolio built. How much um, capital has it taken to make this happen? Because um, you're you're making an investment commitment at several different stages, right? So, what did um, what did you need to get started? Um, well, first we had to have the lobotomy. 
<laughs> okay. Hey, that after was that free. And after, after that and after we recovered from that, um, we're on our way to raising about $100 million through two okay. offerings right now. Um, we've raised a small percentage of that. Um, we think that things will pick up pretty dramatically when we start to announce that we're no longer a startup planning to invest in startups, and we're actually a company that's making investments. But we're, we're ready to move forward on the first one. The second one will be ready to move forward on pretty shortly thereafter. And you know we're not going to leave ourselves or our companies stranded when we're making a capital commitment to them. Sure. Um, the, the way we work is when a company comes in, we anticipate what's their first two years worth of capital gonna, going to be looking like. And then because we're a holding company rather than a fund, we're required to value our companies every six months. So if a company's capital needs change, go up or down, we're going to know what's the valuation and it's just a conversation at that point. It's not a big negotiation. And, you know, our companies aren't getting um, disadvantaged for waiting to, for the next capital round. Why do it as a holding company and not a fund? We wanted to be able to raise money from non-accredited investors because we wanted okay. everybody to have access to venture capital. And that was the only way we could get there. So we're not formed as a fund. Funds typically can have a, a certain number of investors that's typically a hundred so if you're raising 50 million dollars and you divide it by a hundred you're back to accredited rich people institutions pension funds family offices and we welcome them um, but we wanted to make it accessible to everyone and and so this this gets us uh, right where i wanted to go which is regulation d which which enables that uh, was that part of the obama jobs act is that where that when that came in where, where does that what's the origin well, the, our original filing was under Regulation A, which, is, which was part of the JOBS Act. That's the one that allows us to sell to non-accredited investors. Mm -hmm. um, and the SEC has to go through our offering and decide if they're going to qualify it or not. We had a lot of discussions with them about what we were doing. And the, since we were doing something new and they didn't have a model for that, it took a long time to wade through the process. Regulation D is a pretty typical standard form filing. You file it, you're in, you're done. And uh, on, under Regulation D, we can only take accredited investors. Uh, only accredited. Uh, but you wanted to, or you were talking about, pardon me, I got them confused a little bit. You were talking about yeah. Regulation A as a way to bring in non-accredited investors. Right. Why, why was that important to you? It sounds like that's kind of a core belief. Well, Venture capital for at least the last 25 years has been the highest performing of all asset classes. And, it's, and while we've made a lot of money for rich people over the years, it seemed a real shame to us that not everybody could participate when those kinds of returns are really, more, are really as important or more important to you know, non-accredited investors than they might be to um, accredited investors. But non-accredited until us, until we came along, have always been shut out. And just in the interest of, you know, equilibrium in the world, we thought that would be a good uh, thing to do to uh, welcome so, all investors. So um, when you say we felt strongly or you, you all felt this way, who, who are your partners in this and, and the team that felt that way? Well, there are four founders of the company. Um, here I'm, I'm one of them. Um, and my background is, as you know, I worked at Reuters a long time ago. I did a lot of banking and financing along the way to here. Didn't everyone um, work at Reuters a long time ago? I, I th sure I feels that like way. it. Or Bloomberg, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Eric White was my partner. He and I came up with this idea together. Um, Eric was, uh, for a long time, a, a Democratic uh, party operative, uh, went into the lobbying business, went into the investment banking business. He and I have been banking companies together for you know, close to 20 years. Um, we brought in an old friend of mine, Alice Neuhauser, as our uh, CFO. Alice uh, was one of the people who ran Carol Coe Studios and Grammarie Studios and helped shepherd them through their various mm -hmm. bankruptcies. and. Uh, returned a lot of capital to their uh, debt holders and some of their equity holders and enormous respect for Alice. She just was last year the CFO of the year for the small private companies in the LA um, um, Times and the LA Business Journal. I may not have that 100% wow. correct, but it's close. And um, mm -hmm. 
So Alice is our CFO and Jan Giron is our uh, chief legal officer. Jan has been my lawyer for 20 plus years and he brings a mm -hmm. lot of uh, um, steady hand and good problem solving to the, to the conversation. And since we're doing something new mm -hmm. and all our documents look new and all the way our companies come in is new, we really needed to develop some templates and also have some um, stress testing that we've now done. And uh, Jan was just the ideal person to shepherd that through. We're so mm -hmm. lucky to have him as well. So that's our four founders. We've got a huge number of lawyers, accountants, marketing people, <laughs> PR people, you name it, outside. Um, and they're all doing a fantastic job for us. Um, but the core team a lot of is support. I can, I can tell you're well capitalized, or I would, I would guess you're well capitalized. Well, we're certainly spending so, a lot of money. Spending a lot of money. That's different than being well capitalized. But, but um, uh, when you speak about um, so uh, reggae, so th there are there are two big issues for me because I've I've spent some time looking at it, and um, and one is of course how do you market to non-accredited investors? And a related question is you know where do you find them? And a related question is, um, and I think this is a big one actually. How do you make sure? they don't get screwed because this is literally a situation where, I mean, I know you're going to have limits and there are thresholds and so on, but, but, you know, somebody putting in, if let's put it this way, if somebody has 5,000 in savings um, and they f love a company, they love one of your companies and they want to put a thousand dollars in and things don't go well, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a body blow for a small investor. So how do you find them and how do you protect them? That's really my question. Well, on the finding side, we do a lot of outbound marketing on Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, you name it. And people, you know, see our ads and um, we're on like 1200 publications through one consolidator. And, you know, I have people who say, I can't put up a web page without seeing some advertisement from you. Um, mm. So, yeah, and, and people come on and they sign up to get updates from us and then we update them until they feel comfortable. We spend time talking to people on the telephone about what we're doing and how we're doing it. But as to the question of once, once they're in the company, how do we protect them? Well, um, number one, when they invest in Seismic, they're investing in the whole portfolio, not in a single company. So as the portfolio grows, they have a piece of every single company that we invest in. We hope none of them fail. We're doing everything we can to make sure none of them fail. But even if one does, they're still invested in the rest of the portfolio. Um, we think the second path to success on that is that since we are taking over a lot of that back office um, activity, we're not letting our companies get mired in that distraction so in, in, they can the, like, getting too bureaucratic getting too bloated getting too distracted well, well that and just getting distracted you know i mean when's yeah. the last time you tried to set up benefits for for a company it's an enormous pain in the neck and you, you know by the time you talk to people and understand what it is and understand what they're offering to sell you and compare all the this that's and the others you know you've missed three weeks of working on your product and so yeah. we're whatever we're doing we're making sure that our entrepreneurs can concentrate on making their product and acquiring their customers rather than doing this boring stuff that doesn't accrue to anyone's benefit even though it's benefits um and then at the at the end of the day if they bought their shares and they've held them for five years or more uh, when they sell their shares hopefully we'll have had some distributions along the way and some dividends along the way but if they decide to sell their shares what we're issuing now while we're still small is qualified small business stock which exempts uh, owners from uh, paying federal capital gains taxes and also exempts most people from paying uh, state capital gains taxes i say most people wow, because that, california that seems, doesn't have that that seems significant it is I mean, you know, for some people, it's 20, 30, 40 percent savings on the on their capital gains. Yeah, no, but I mean, it certainly it, it makes it, you know, uh, that much more of an attractive investment opportunity, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the other thing we're doing right now is we, we hadn't anticipated that we would go down this route, but we have 
one institutional investor that's very excited about what we're doing. They're, for, they're forming an exchange that will trade kind of arcane instruments. Um, but the notion that we could provide them with product to put onto their exchange, which is our companies going public in a different way than on NASDAQ, um, was very uh, enticing to them. So if we, can, if we can land that investor, and they're putting in lots and lots of money into Seismic in order to help us accelerate our growth, it's, it all accrues to the benefit of our smaller investors because you know, there's a big pile of money backing their investment. Would they be, so they'd be interested in taking you public on on uh, quit rather quickly. We've talked about it. I'm not. I'm not no. sure we're okay. ready or they're ready. We'll see what happens. That happens to be my favorite subject in life lately. But yes, I know. We can talk about that on another podcast quickly. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's another subject. And um, you know, Steve and I intentionally asked you about seismic initially um, because I knew um, that if I started asking you about your personal stuff and our overlapping that I would have no podcast. I would just have you and me well, we chatting. We have an opportunity for your viewers to, and listeners to fall asleep. Yeah, but there, there are a couple things here. I mean, I think that um, I recently heard of a company called TeamShares that has raised a, an equivalent amount of money, I think, as to, to what you're raising. Um, and they have a mission that's, that's a little different, um, which is that they're looking for owners who are retiring and they're turning those companies into um, companies, uh, you know, employee stock ownership plan type companies. Right. So that the 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 employees um, take over the the ownership of the company and continue to run it after the the the, uh, the original owner retires. And it's um, you know, it's obviously and it's a mission driven company, Team Shares. I met I met one of the people who's a, who's about to start there recently, and it strikes me that if there is and I'm going to pontificate for about thirty seconds if there is one problem that has to be addressed in in the United States and probably most developed countries if not all it is uh, income inequality, and I think what I'm hearing from you what I'm sensing is that you know that's a priority for you that's kind of what you're doing. Um, same thing with this team shares company. It's like if we don't do something about that problem, you know, we're not going to have we may we may not have a country. I mean, I, it may take a while, but, you know, that is so fundamental because um, one last bit of pontification, you know, you and I grew up thinking probably I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this, that if you worked hard, you could make it to the top that that regardless of where you started, you could you could do well. And the reality is you kind of end up where you start. If you start higher up, you're going to end up higher up. If you start close to the bottom, you're going to end up close to the bottom in most cases. So it strikes me that philosophically you're trying to do something good here. Well, we can only do what we can do. But, what we can, but in that world of what can we do, we can make sure that our entrepreneurs uh, get paid a living wage. Uh, we can mm -hmm. seek out non-traditional entrepreneurs, people who don't come from the typical, you know, Stanford engineering background, you know, people who may not have ever heard of Sand Hill Road. Um, we, we have started to reach out to uh, university entrepreneurship programs and accelerators. We've mm -hmm. reached out to um, accelerators that back women entrepreneurs, um, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, mm -hmm. and. You know, partly we do that because, like you say, it is the right thing to do. And, you know, maybe we do fix some of the wrongs in the world. The other thing is it gives us an opportunity not to overpay for the deal that everybody's chasing. So, you know, it works for us and for everybody if we if we get it right. And, well, you're like, you know, anybody you're like, can overpay for a deal, but it sure is hard to sell your way out of overpaying for something. Well, maybe you're like the missionaries who went to... Uh colonize the world and, and the and people said of them they went to do good and they did very well indeed so uh well, so that, i know about that, that but i'll take that as a compliment that, that would I be, guess. <laughs> yes yes that wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen well um i want to remind everyone you've been listening to the angel podcast with michael con if that's me we're aimed at angels and venture capitalists uh venture studios um any family offices or investment firms 
trying to make the most of working with founders. Um, I want to remind you also, you can go to my website, Michael Conniff, C-O-N-N-I-F-F.com. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, we'd love it if you listen, not just listen to the podcast, shared it, rated it, subscribe to it. All of that would be great on, uh, I think we're on like over 12 platforms now. So that would, that would be lovely. Um, Congratulations. I want to well, you know, it, it wasn't that hard, to be honest. <laughs> and and I, I know you're a media guy, so I take that as a compliment. But uh, but Stephen Weinstein, uh, Weinstein, the CEO of Seismic Capital, you've been a fantastic guest. You're doing really interesting things. And uh, we, we've got to have you back. But I first want to thank you for coming on now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I've had a good time. You give a good, good interview. Good. Thank you. And um, thank you all for listening. And remember, we'll be back with another podcast before you know it.